notes on the top. Just write this on top of your page, please, if you will. The 10 attitudes for leadership development. 10 attitudes for leadership development. Leaders are very unique people. They have a very simple distinction, and that is their thinking is different. Leaders do not think like followers. Leaders used to be followers, all of them. But what made them cross the line was a certain mentality that kicked in somewhere. Something happened to them that made them think differently. And I normally call that attitudes that influence people. If you want to be an impactful personality, you have to develop certain types of thinking and perceptions that change the way you see yourself and see the world. I call this the spirit of leadership. Now there are only two animals on the planet that the creator identified himself with. I want you to write them down. When I read the entire Bible, which is my favorite book, I read four books a month. I've read hundreds of books and that's my commitment. For the last 20 years, I've been reading four books a month. And that gives you an idea of how much reading I do. Because if you're going to become influenced in the world, you have to be a reader. And when I read the Bible, I was shocked to find that there are two animals that the Creator identified himself with. The first one is the eagle. The eagle. And the second animal is the lion. And when I identified those two animals as his favorite to identify himself with, I recognize I better study these two animals because if he is the leader of the universe and I want to be a leader on earth, I better find out the nature of these animals and also the attitude of these animals. And I discovered that both of them are the kings of their domain. The eagle is the king of the bird kingdom. And the lion is the king of the animal kingdom. I don't, therefore, want to not understand them. Well, I want to talk about the lion today, even though I can do a session on the eagle, which is very important. But let's talk a little bit about the lion. The lion has what I call the spirit of leadership. And this word spirit here is referring to attitude. Everybody say attitude. A leader has a attitude that makes him or her different from followers. And the lion exhibits that attitude. We have to cultivate the same attitudes that the lion has because the lion apparently has been given the same attitudes that God himself identifies with and he put it in these creatures. And apparently, you and I are supposed to be the king of the animal kingdom, the rulers of all animals. So obviously, we have somewhere trapped on the inside these same potential attitudes. Now, the lion is the king of the jungle, but the lion to me is a great source of encouragement to all of us. I want you to write this down. Remember this as long as you live. Number one, the lion is not the tallest animal in the jungle. Number two, the lion is not the largest animal in the jungle. Number three, the lion is not the heaviest animal in the jungle. Number four, the lion is not the smartest animal or the most intelligent animal in the jungle. And yet, the lion is the king. I tell your neighbor, there's hope for you. That's right, because you ain't tall, you ain't smart, you ain't intelligent, you ain't the biggest, but you could be the leader. The lion, therefore, cancels all of your excuses for not becoming a leader. You don't need to be intelligent. You don't need to be smart. You don't need to have a certain height. You don't need to have a certain weight. You don't need to have any kind of advantage. And yet you can be the leader. Now what's the main thing that shocks me with the lion is that the lion is not larger than the giraffe, bigger than the elephant, or heavier than the hippo. The lion is an amazing creature. He's not as smart as the hyena or the snake. And yet 
when he shows up, they all run away. What makes the lion so unique? Well, here's one of my favorite quotes that I put in my books, and I believe it really brings home the point. An army of sheep led by a lion will always defeat an army of lions led by a sheep. And the answers to that dilemma is this. Because leadership can transform cowards into violent warriors. The right kind of leadership can transform a timid into bold people who are fearless. Leadership is that powerful. Leadership can walk into a camp of depressed people and in 20 minutes they have turned on into unbelievable powerful armies because leadership determines everything. Now why would a lion become the king of the jungle when he has all of those limitations. He's not the tallest, not the strongest, not the smartest, not the heaviest, not the most intelligent, but yet he runs things. And that's because the lion has something that we need to capture. The lion is the king of the jungle because of one word, attitude. Everybody say attitude. attitude. Write it down, attitude. The lion has a different attitude that makes every animal afraid of him. Now, we don't want to lead by fear, but it does take respect for you to become a leader. When I use the word fear in the jungle, we're talking about respect. The elephant respects the lion. The hyenas respect the lion, the, the giraffes, they respect the lion. What makes these massive animals respect such a small cat? The attitude is the difference. For example, a lion will see an elephant and the thing that comes to his mind, one word, lunch. <laughs> now the elephant is 10 times the size of the lion, probably 50 times heavier and has more power, one stump of his feet could destroy the lion. But when the lion sees the elephant, he doesn't look at size and weight and strength and power. He looks at lunch. I could eat this thing. And he acts the way he thinks. Say it. He acts the way, you see, the size is not the problem. The weight of the elephant is not his concern. What makes him Act is the way he thinks. And because he thinks he can eat the, the elephant, he attacks him. Leadership attitude. Now here's another amazing mystery. The elephant is larger, bigger, stronger, more powerful, heavier, and more intelligent. And yet when the elephant sees the lion, one word comes to mind, eater. <laughs> New word, write it down, eater. In other words, the, 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 the elephant is controlled by the way he thinks. He thinks that he is lunch. Therefore, his size, his weight, his power, his might, his his authority is a victim of the way he thinks. It doesn't matter how big you are, how intelligent you are, how many degrees you get. It's your mind that keeps you small. And it doesn't matter how small you are or how un unintelligent you may seem to be or how much you don't have. It's your mind that makes you the leader. Attitude. The attitude, therefore, is the difference. Write this down. The difference between a leader and a follower is attitude. Why? Because it is unique attitudes that distinguish leaders from followers. They think differently. And that's because 
attitudes produce certain behaviors. And those behaviors stretch the leader beyond the limitations of the norm. In other words, it is the thinking of the person that makes them see circumstances differently. People ask me, how am I doing? My answer is, I have no problems. I haven't had a problem for the last 35 years. Why? Because nothing in my life is a problem. The word problem is a human definition of an opportunity to grow. If you call it a problem, it's a negative. If you see it as an opportunity, it becomes a positive. How do you think? Write this down. Attitude is a product of belief. This is very important to develop your leadership. Attitude is a product of belief. You cannot have an attitude beyond your belief. So your attitude comes from your belief system. The lion is the king because of what he believes about himself and what he believes about the lion, I mean, the, the elephant, and the giraffe. He believes that they are lunch, and he believes he can eat them. His belief system controls the whole situation when they meet. I was born not too far from here in a wooden house right down in the lowest income part of this country called Bainstown. I was born in a house on four rocks, two bedrooms, 11 kids, one mother, one father. One bedroom for my mom and dad, the other for my seven sisters. Some of them are here today. And uh, of course the boys had to find somewhere to sleep. I remember sleeping on a mattress on the floor. I remember sleeping on one time on a, on a mat. And that sheet never kept the mosquitoes out. All around me was poverty, but we didn't know that because everybody was poor. The only way you know you're poor is when you meet, meet a rich person, okay? So, and there I was, sleeping on the floor, wonderful family. They loved me, we loved one another. My parents loved us, we loved them, we had a great family, but we didn't have much. And every opportunity was around me to think negative. I was on the other side with alcoholics all over the place, and, and I remember, you know, my mother and father would tell us things to, to fix our belief system. They would say, you can do anything you want to do, son. And they said that when I was sleeping on the floor. They were working on my belief system. And then they taught us the Bible. Now, I don't know about you and your belief about the Bible, but the Bible made me what I am today, so don't you talk bad about the Bible. And if you don't believe in the Bible, that's okay. I'm doing just fine, believe me. And the Bible helped me become what I am. But it was that book that checked my thinking because I was born under colonialism where all my teachers were white and they called us half-breeds. I remember one time my teacher called me a half-breed monkey. He said, you cannot learn. He said, I don't know why I came away from Scotland just to deal with you black children. You are uneducable, he says. Your brain is not normal. You are not intelligent creatures. You are like monkeys. And I was sitting there crying because the guy was just laying into me and I was believing him. Working on my thinking. I almost believed him. And then I went home and told my mother with tears in my eyes. I, I had my book in a brown paper bag from the shopping market because we couldn't afford school bags. And I remember going home with that brown paper bag, crying and telling my mom and dad that my teachers I'm a monkey and I can't learn and that something's wrong with me and I'm retarded and we cannot you know, measure up to their level of expectation. And I began to cry and my mother said, it doesn't matter what your teacher says, come here boy. And she sat me down on that bed she said, open the Bible. I said, yes, ma'am. I'm crying, tears dropping down on the book. She said, turn to Ephesians. I said, I can't spell that. <laughs> so she found it for me. I was just a young kid, 11 years old. And she said, now read verse 20. I said, yes, ma'am. And I read it. Ephesians 3 verse 20. Don't you laugh at the Bible. The verse said, now unto him 
who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above, far beyond all you can ever ask, think, or imagine according to the power that worketh within you. To him be glory. Mom said, read it again. I read it. She said, read it again. I read it. I said, read it again. She said, read it and tell you don't have to look at it. And I sat there and I memorized that verse in one afternoon. She said, now that's what you believe. And I realized that the power of my future was not in the teacher. It was inside of me. And suddenly that day I became my own teacher. I really did. I didn't trust any more teachers anymore. I went from an F student to an A student in one semester because of my belief system. I graduated from that school. It was called Robinson Road School. It's now called CH Reeves, right down the street. I graduated head boy. I used to be an F student and a half-breed monkey, remember? <laughs> it was my what? Belief system. Write this down. No one can live beyond the limits of their belief. So if you want to live beyond what you're living now, you have to change your belief system. Leaders are born when you have the discovery of a new belief system. The secret to anyone rising is what happens in their belief system. And that's what this conference is about. Write this down, please. Your life is what you think it should be. That's exactly what you are right now. You are what you thought you should be. And if you don't like who you are, you got to change what you think you should be. That's how leaders are born. I'm going to move fast, so you're better right fast. You see that uh, picture there? I love this picture. That's what you need to do. This conference is the mother lion. And the little cub is you. And we're going to train you how to go get that elephant. Look at that kid looking. Look at him looking. Whatever mom looking at, he looking at what mom looking at. By the way, when the lions attack the elephant, the males never go. Only the females attack. Come on, ladies, give me a hand. <laughs> Only females attack. It's amazing. And once the prey is down, then the men come in and start eating stuff. <laughs> that's, because, that's because the men are cowards. <laughs> no amount of training in leadership skills, no amount of ship courses, or management methods or titles, no amount of promotion or associations with rich people or smart people can ever substitute for the right attitude. No substitute for it. As a matter of fact, your leadership development is determined by, number one, your perception of who you are, number two, by why you think you exist, and number three, these are very important, your sense of significance. I am giving you my secret to life right here. What brought me from the floor to flying my own jet is these simple statements here. You got to first change your perception of who you are. And that starts with a belief system. Secondly, you must change your perception of why you think you exist. And number three, your sense of significance. Once you discover no matter where you are right now, it doesn't matter. I don't care what situation you're in now, where you're working, or what situation you're in. If you get these three things to come alive in this session, when I see you again, you'll have a story to tell me. Number one, your perception of who you are. You've got to change it. And most of our perceptions are other people's concepts of us, and therefore we don't have self-concept, we've got other concepts. What is your perception of who you are? And the second one, why do you think you exist? You got to discover that you were born for something, some reason, there's some purpose for your life. If you don't discover that, you'll always have a job and we'll bury you in an average grave with an average tombstone. 
And you must develop a sense of significance in your life. Discover that you are important to the human race, you are important to the world, you are important to your universe. When I had to grapple with that question, it was tough. Because I've been taught by society, like you have, that you are just a social security number or some NIB number or you're some just kind of a, a, a worker in the system. But that's not true. You were born to do something very significant in the world. And you have to get to the point where you believe that. Cultivating these attitudes are the key to becoming a leader. Now, when attitudes of leadership is married to the ability of leadership, then you become a leader. You can have potential, but if you don't have the belief, your potential becomes a victim of your present belief. Remember the elephant? The elephant has great power, but what makes him afraid of the lion is his belief system. So your mentality has to be equal to your ability for you to manifest leadership. You do have the ability, you were born with it to be a leader, but your mentality hasn't matched it yet. And that's why all of your capacity to lead is buried under your lack of belief that you can. Belief is so powerful, it can make an elephant act like a sheep in the presence of a lion. You know, normally people who are insecure, Whenever they meet somebody who is confident, they always call the confident arrogant. <laughs> when you discover who you are, you can't help but be confident. I don't pretend, I don't try to have confidence. If you try, that means you ain't got it. It's, you're faking it. Confidence is a product of belief. What you believe about yourself determines the way you think about yourself, and the way you think about yourself is the way you behave. And you behave bold and confident and fearless because there's some things you discovered about you and about life that makes life change a perception. Put it another way, write this down. You can never fully carry out the mandate of leadership if you don't have the mentality of leadership. And that's what this session is about. It's about mentality. A matter of fact, integrating attitude and ad attributes and at aptitude and altitude produces leadership. That's a lot of apps there. Write that down, please. Each one of them is a different experience for leaders. First of all, your attitude got to be right. Then you must marry that to attributes. That means gifts you were born with. Then you got to marry that to aptitude. That means now you got to educate and train those gifts. That's why you read and study and go to school, for your, at, for your aptitude to be increased. And then your altitude means you got to change the level of associations you are in. You know, it's amazing. When you change your aptitude, you normally want to change your altitude. Leaders choose their friends based on their destination. And one of the keys to developing leadership is you have to appreciate the fact that no one is responsible for your life except you. I had to take charge of my life as a teenager. And at age 13, I discovered who I was. I became a problem to the whole family. My mom used to say to me, she'd say, you are a different boy. You are a different child. But something happened to me at age 13. I discovered myself. Different was simply meaning you don't think like the rest of the kids. That's all it means. And remember, thinking is belief system being exposed. And therefore, I married my attitude and my attributes and my aptitude changed and I began to study for a different reason. And suddenly my altitude changed. I started attracting different types of friends. By the way, you know, when you, an eagle, you see, the other animal that God identifies himself with, I studied eagles intensely. I got a whole series on eagles because you must study to understand life. And I discussed what, what eagles, they said eagles can fly up to three to four miles in the sky. That's almost high as some jet planes. 
And do you know that when an eagle is flying at top flight, they say that if an eagle meets another bird in top flight, it has to be another eagle. Because they're the only birds that can fly at that altitude. So, here's a thought to take back to work with you. If you keep running into pigeons, and ducks, and tobacco doves, <laughs> you are flying too low. Do you know what a pigeon is? Eagles never flock. You only find them one at a time. So if you keep attracting a gang of people around you at work, everybody want to bring gossip to you, you know, cackling, duck, cap, 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 cap. You are in bad company. That's why I really want you to give yourself a big hand today, because to come here, you must be an eagle. You left the pigeons back at the office. Well, why are you going down there? Who do you think they are? They can't teach you nothing. Hey, that's a chicken talking. And they only fly when they're frightened. If you're going to be a leader, you got to be careful who you fly with. People who criticize got time for it. And that's why I ignore them. I ignore my critics because they got time for it. I'm too busy. I'm too busy succeeding. I'm giving them something to, to criticize. The greatest revenge in life, they say, is success. <laughs> Write this down. It's not ability. It's mentality that makes a leader. It's not ability. It's what? Mentality. That elephant and that hippopotamus has power. They got ability, strength, size. They got might. They got ability. What they lack is ment. The lion got a different mentality, so he eats them for lunch. <laughs> Write this down. What you think is more important than what you do. And so if you want to change, you got to work on this attitude bit. There's my conference people again. Working on this. Okay. Here's my philosophy. My philosophy and the philosophy of this association, the Third Association, is this. Trapped in every follower is a hidden leader. Say that with me. Trapped in every follower is a hidden leader. Say it again. Say it loud. Raise the roof. Point at somebody and tell them right to the face. Come on, say it. Trapped in every follower is hidden leader. Say it one more time. Trapped in every follower is hidden leader. Therefore, the goal of true leadership is to release the hidden leader in the followers. If you are a true leader in your department or in your company supervisory position, if you are a true leader as a pastor or maybe as a, 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 a manager in some company, your greatest example of leadership is production of leaders. True leaders do not maintain followers. They produce leaders. True leadership focuses on producing leaders, not followers. That picture again on that screen, that mother knows that that cub must become a leader. So look how early she's training him watching how to watch and study your prey moving across the prairie look at that son you see how that elephant moves right you see how he swirls right see how he swirls to the weight right study that why that's gonna be your lunch in a few months in other words a true leader begins to train people under their care immediately to take leadership i put it to you that every one of us got a little leader hidden on the inside that's you right there look at that that cute Inside that little cub is an awesome beast. Tell your neighbor, don't misjudge me yet. I'll eat you for lunch. <laughs> Clap your hands, all you great lions. Come on, let's see it out of here. Don't let nobody judge you. 
You look very innocent right now, but tell them you're going to work for me. Tell them, I'm going to let you work for me in the future. I'm going to hire you. <laughs> the capacity to lead is in every human being. And leadership is like a tree trapped in a seed. You know, trees are not in the soil. They are trapped in a seed. And every one of you that walked through that door today is a seed that was sent to the planet to produce a tree to serve the world your fruit. That's why you were born. And deep inside of you is a person no one knows yet. And what you've done so far is just initiation process. That's why no one should cancel you yet because you ain't quite come out yet. As a matter of fact, when they see you, they're going to be glad they sat next to you. Come on, sat, shake your hand right now. Tell them you're going to be glad you sat next to me one day. Yes, sir. They're going to say, I remember that guy on TV. He sat with me and they signed the conference. Oh, yeah, I remember that guy downtown who owns that 50-story building. He sat with me in the conference in Nassau. Oh, yes, that guy who walked out of that private jet. I used to know him. He sat with the conference next to me. Come on, tell somebody, you don't know who I am. So take me for lunch tomorrow. <laughs> you never know who you're sitting next to. Write this down. Leadership manifestation requires the right environment. You know, a seed can be placed on a windowsill in your tiled bathroom and stay there for 50 years and the tree never come out. Even though the seed has a tree and a forest in it, it is a victim of the environment. If you can just get that seed off that windowsill and put it in soil with a little bit of water, here comes the future. That's the way life is. You are no different from a seed. So coming to a summit like this and sitting among people like this, this is fertilizer. This whole week is a seed bed. It's soil for you to put yourself in. Matter of fact, when you leave here, imagine you got to prepare yourself. You got to go back to those rocky people in your job. Rocks. I say rocks. That's why you got to buy books from here and get these tapes from these great speakers and these CDs. Why? Because you want to keep fertilizer even when you're away from the conference. You got to keep fertilizer coming. You know, my car is a mobile seminar hall. I got stacks of CDs that I buy, you know, Les Brown and Tim Reb and all the others, and I put them in my car. And when I'm driving, every time I sit in my car, I'm feeding my seed constantly. Even the music you listen to, got to be careful. It can be poison to your germination of your seed. The next time someone says they want to get to know you, ask them, are you fertilizer or rock? <laughs> there are some folks in your life right now who are very toxic. They will pollute your seed. You'll never come out. Have you noticed that people who ain't going nowhere want you to go with them? Folks who ain't doing nothing in life want you to do it with them. This is why you got to break away from your best friend sometime to become better. You outgrow people, so know when to leave. If they keep asking you questions, it's time to go. Be with people who, who you can ask questions. That's how you grow. Write this down, very important. True attitude is manifested in attitude. And what I mean by that is when you discover leadership, it comes out in your attitude. An attitude must be a product of your belief system. Everybody in here have attitude. Everybody. What's about the leadership attitude? There are two types of concepts that I wrote in my book on the spirit of leadership that I try Hopefully people understand it. The first one is the leadership spirit and the spirit of leadership. Two different concepts. The leadership spirit is what you were born with. 
It's like the elephant being born with natural strength. Every human being in this place was born with the leadership spirit. You were born to be a leader. However, for that spirit to ignite, you must have the spirit of leadership added to it. And that's the mentality. So leadership spirit is inherent in every human being, but the spirit of leadership must be ignited from belief system. Your ability, you never receive it, you came with it. But your ability that you were born with is trapped by the mentality that they gave you from the, your, your, your culture. This is why to be great, you got to divorce yourself from your traditions and your culture. Because convention makes no room for creativity. It doesn't allow you to believe beyond the norm. Matter of fact, they want you to fit in, not stand out. So society is all worked, it's all designed for you to behave yourself. You know, uh, I was sharing this when I was in South Africa two weeks ago about, I was in uh, Germany one time, driving on the autobahn, and my, my host was driving me, you know, for the first time, I went on an autobahn. An autobahn is a road in Germany that has no speed limit. Can you imagine that, Bahamians? I know some of you all pray for that to come to the Bahamas, but we ain't long enough for it here in Nassau. So in Europe, they got these big roads called autobahns. And the autobahn is unlimited speed, no signs on it. No police ever is on that place. And you can drive as fast as you possibly can, as much as you want. I had never seen one before. So this guy had this beautiful black Mercedes pick me up. We go into another town. We go into Villa, Wilhelmshaven up north. And I went there to speak. And we drove from the town we were in. And this guy came off the side road, up on the autobahn, and we took off. And this car took off. And it just went 90, 100, 150, 170. And I'm sitting there just giddy. <laughs> Man, I was, I, I was like, this is crazy. I love it. <laughs> so he looked at me. He says, is something wrong? I said, 180. He said, so? I said, no. <laughs> It was my convention kicking in. Even when I was free to go as fast as I could, my training was saying no. So he did something interesting. He says, at the next rest stop, I'm going to pull over, and I want you to drive. I say, yes, sir. <laughs> Dreaming of this all my life. He pulled in there. He switched seats with me. Man, listen, I was like a little boy again. I pulled on that autobahn and hit that accelerator, and I'm flying. 100, woo, 110, hey, 120, mm hmm, 125. All of a sudden, my fear kicks in. I better stay at 125. <laughs> All of a sudden, I heard something pass me. He said, the guy laughed, he says, You're standing still. <laughs> so, my pride got a hold of me. I said, I'm a Bahamian man. No one beats a Bahamian. I'm a catch him. <laughs> and I took off, man. 125, 150, 180. I saw the guy coming closer and closer. And 190, I was right next to the guy. And I'm going, <laughs> and I passed him. Psst. 200 kilometers per hour. That time I'm laughing, yes, I got it, man. I'm ahead of the, the whole pack. Ten minutes later, a guy passed me, shoo! I said, not again. <laughs> Isn't it amazing that what you celebrate, God's disappointed. All your trophies in your office is your greatest enemy. Write this down. The greatest enemy of progress is your last success. The minute you become so impressed by what you're doing, someone passes you in life. I learned a lesson that day. I, the car I was in had 300 on the speedometer, 300 kilometers on the speedometer. And I'd, 180, I was proud of myself. And someone passed me at 205. 
And then my host said to me, what are you afraid of? I said, I don't know. We got to the city. I was confused all night after that. I kept asking myself a question. Why didn't I go all the way? And the answer I got was simple. You're trained to limit yourself. Isn't it amazing that you buy a car that can travel 150 miles per hour, 180 miles per hour, and then the, the same country that sells the car to you puts up a sign, 50. <laughs> no, you never thought about that. That's a problem. Yeah, see, see, Ford Motor Company makes the car to make 180, and then they make sure you only can travel 50. Society is designed to make sure you never become a leader. And that's why for you to become a leader in your workplace, you're going to have to break away from the traditions. Now, I want to warn you, when you decide to break the speed limit, all your enemies will wake up in the office. Every critic that you thought was your friend will suddenly come alive. Because people don't want you to leave them in their nothingness. You can't lead from behind. <laughs> I never forget, one day I was up in South Dakota speaking at a church. Big meeting in the middle of this field where all these farms are. And they took me into town. I'd never seen so many, you know, uh, milk farms. And I saw a whole herd of cows, you know, going down the side of the, the road uh, on the field. And I noticed that there was no one leading, just kind of a bunch of cows, just cows kind of walking. And they were all behind, each, you know, the ones behind. And I realized that the guys behind, all they saw was hips. Anyhow, y'all are slow. See, <laughs> what a way to live life, just seeing somebody's rump. <laughs> but you see, we love to see rumps. Because when you see somebody's rump, you don't have to think. That's why sheep are not leaders. They follow the sheep hips in front of them. But when you're out front, ain't no hip to follow. You gotta design your course. And that takes boldness and risk. It takes all kinds of challenging commitment to, to decide where you wanna go in life out front. Please write this down. Having the leadership spirit means that you are naturally created to lead. But the mentality is what wakes it up. And here I am at age 13, hiding in the bush. Some of you in this room look just like that. You, you are powerful, but they got you in the bush. The social environment is just making you afraid to come out and take what's yours in life. I put it to you this way. There was a story of a man, his name was Caleb. Caleb was the man in the bush until he ran into his creator and his mentality was changed. And here's what Moses said, you know, rather what God said to Caleb. Uh, Caleb and Joshua were the only two guys in the Bible who went to the dream that God gave the whole country. Everybody else died in the desert. And you remember Moses told a story, I mean, Moses, the story is about Moses. He told the 12 tribes to choose a leader. He took the leader and sent the 12 leaders into the land that they were going. To. And uh, the text says that when they went into the land to check out the land that was already theirs according to promise, they all came back and 10 of them told Moses that the land they saw had big giants in them. And then they also told Moses that we were like grasshoppers in their eyes. Now they never talked to the, to the giants to find out if that's what the giants thought about them. Let me say that slow, you missed that. They went into the land to check it out. It was already theirs. They saw some people in the land. They came back and told Moses, the people are like giants. And then they said, and we are like grasshoppers in their eyes. How did they know that? You are the way you see yourself. Do you think you're a grasshopper? The elephant actually thinks it's a meal for a cat. 
It was their thinking that made them not go into the land. However, Caleb and Joshua came, and Caleb and Joshua said, uh, Moses, don't believe them. We are well able to take the land. The people, oh, they're nothing. We can knock them off. The farms, matter of fact, then they said, the farms are beautiful. The grapes are big. I mean, all the cattle, man. Hey, Mo, let's go get them. The attitude was different. And here's God's response to Caleb and Joshua. He says, because my servant Caleb has a what? Different spirit, small s, means attitude, and follows me wholeheartedly, I will bring him into the land. In other words, the only difference between the two and the ten was attitude. They saw the same thing. They saw the same people. They saw the same land. But their perceptions were different based on their belief system. That's what makes a leader a leader. The mindset of a leader is what changes his attitude toward life and himself. Write this down. Caleb possessed the spirit of leadership, which is attitude. He was not a man that was bigger than them or stronger. His thinking was different. And that was the only distinguishing factor that the Creator said made the difference. Read that verse again. He says the only difference was their spirit was different. And the word there means attitude. It's a small s. Now, mentality can do that to you. Look at that beast. Isn't that a proud-looking creature? I mean no fear, just peaceful. That's how I am. No problem. I don't feel like eating right now. Say, so all of y'all are lucky, he says. <laughs> the spirit of leadership refers to attitudes, mentality, and mindset. And it is required for leadership. Therefore, without the spirit of leadership, the leadership spirit remains dormant. And this is a very important point as we bring this wonderful day to a close. The spirit of leadership is necessary for the leadership spirit to come forth. And that's been the key to all great leaders. And sometimes that spirit comes forth under pressure. Many leaders in history are products of circumstances that force them to think differently. That's what makes them emerge as leaders. So having the spirit of leadership means that you understand and demonstrate the mindset of a leader. All right, let me quickly, uh, forgive me for moving so fast because I got a lot to finish here. I want you to write this list down as quickly as you possibly can. I got too much stuff for you, all right? I know. I'm loaded, man. I'm loaded. Okay. The spirit of leadership is a mindset. It dictates your motivation. It, re it is revealed in your response to your environment. The spirit of leadership is a perception of yourself and the world. How do you see the world? The spirit of leadership is your convictions that regulate your thoughts about yourself and people. The spirit of leadership is your personal private philosophy of life. How you think about life and yourself. The spirit of leadership is your thoughts about oneself and one's environment. Please buy this CD and put it in your car on the highway. The spirit of leadership is your thoughts about yourself and the environment. It is your belief system which controls your behavior. The spirit of leadership is the source of your action which determines the response and how you interpret the world. This is very important. I see the world differently from most people because of my belief system which becomes my attitude creator. So I don't panic over nothing. I don't panic. Panic is a product of a certain belief system. If my house burns down today, well, I guess I got to build a bigger one. I always wanted to get rid of this house anyhow. Thank you, fire. <laughs> you know, your attitude is determined by your belief system. This last one on the bottom. The spirit of leadership is the source of your actions which determine the response of how you interpret life. And therefore, it is your mental conditioning. Your mental conditioning. The spirit of leadership is your mental conditioning. And this entire summit every year is designed to work on your mental conditioning, to give you a different 
way of thinking every year. You change more and more so that your life changes. There are so many testimonies in this room. Folks been coming here for 20 years. And they went from zero, impacting millions of people today, and they're back every year still. Why? Because they know that it doesn't just happen by luck. Success keeps the right company all the time. All the time. All right, let me give you another list. Write this down. <laughs> you have to nurture yourself so that you can produce the right attitudes. And nurture means to feed yourself the right information. We are what we think, and we become what we continue to think. And this is why I constantly monitor my thinking processes. But every time I have a chance, I have a book in the bathroom, a book in my briefcase, I got a book in the office, you know, I got a book by the toilet. So wherever I am, I'm working on a chapter somewhere. Because I got to get through these four books every month. I love my wife. She reads a lot. She reads more than me. And our house is full of books. Our kids, we never to tell them read. They watch us read all the time. If you want your kids to value books, you should value them. You tell your kids, go read the book, go read your homework, and then you watch TV. They're confused. Hey, boy, say values. values. Say it loud. Values. Your kids will value what you value. If you value TV, they're going to hate books. If they watch you always reading books, they're going to turn the TV off because whatever mom and dad values and mom and dad are doing well, that must be what we should do too. So our kids fell in love with books. My house is full of books. I'm beginning to run out of house. Because you become what you think. You cannot rise above the plane of your mental conditioning. So I got to constantly keep feeding my mentality. I have to work on it so I can work up my altitude of mentality. You, to change your life, you must change your mind. And this is why the heart of leadership is working on the way a person thinks. Now, pardon me. Here's the most important thing to write down. <laughs> hey, trust me with this one. Write this one down, okay? Seven principles of true leadership. Number one, true leadership is inherent in the human spirit. You have to believe that first. Every human being possesses the capacity to be a leader. Whether they die as a follower is a choice. Number two, true leadership cannot be taught. It must be discovered. This is why going to any leadership course or any leadership school doesn't produce leaders. Fortune 500 companies spend billions of dollars every year sending their would-be leaders, managers to all kinds of seminars all over America, and they come right back and be the same person. Because leadership cannot be taught, really. It must be discovered on the inside. Number three, true leadership is self-discovery. And number four, true leadership is serving your gift to the world. Everyone in this room was born with a specific gift. Some of you got two of them. Don't try and develop all of your gifts. Focus on one. Make it your primary gift. And then refine it. And then serve it to the world. The key to leadership is service. But it doesn't mean servitude as making yourself of less value. You serve because you have value. It is your gift that makes you valuable, and serving it is your responsibility. And the better you serve your gift, the greater leadership you achieve. That's why Jesus said, the greatest among you is the one who serves everybody. The greatest is the one who serves. The greatest is the one who serves. So whoever can serve that gift more effectively, they become the greatest in the group. No one came to earth without a gift. The problem is we try to take other people's gifts and make them ours. If you become an imitation, you're going to be broke. You need to find your gift, your strength, your unique power, and you need to take that and say, I'm going to become this, and then serve it to the world, 
And that's your leadership born that day. Write this down. Number five, true leadership is self-deployment. Everybody say deployment. You know, in developing countries, we are basically, by the colonial philosophy, educated to be employed. And that is still one of our problems in the Bahamas, in Jamaica, in Barbados. It's heavy there. Trinidad, St. Lucia, St. Thomas, St. Kitts, Grenada. We're suffering from this problem. All over Africa, South America, same problem. Venezuela just came from there a couple of months ago. Same spirit there. Argentina went down there. Same spirit there in Argentina. I mean, we're all suffering from this, this mentality of the colonial spirit. And you folks from America who were part of the slave uh, uh, experience, you have the same mentality, still fighting with it. In other words, we've all been taught to be employed, not deployed. And so they always tell you, go to school, get an education so you can get a job. You ever heard that before? Stay in school so you can get an education so you can get a job. They never say stay in school so you can own a business. They don't even think that way. You mean, they don't even, it doesn't even cross. Your parents don't even think that way. And so you follow the convention of the community. And I was, I'll never forget the meeting when I went to Malaysia to speak. I was speaking at the, the largest Sony plant. I had two days with them. The first day, I spoke to all the managers, all the CEOs. I was the, the speaker to train them. And these people, man, they're all slant eyes, you know. <laughs> there was Chinese and Japanese and Singaporeans. All these folks were there in Malaysia working for Sony. And I had to do training there for management development and leadership training for the whole day. And then the next day, I had to speak to 2,000 of the workers in the plant who were making television. They were producing, you know, CD players. That's where all this stuff comes from. There's the big plant in Malaysia where they make this stuff. And I was there the second day and did training all day. The third day, the president of that particular firm called me up and he says, our CEOs and our executives are so impressed by you, we want to take you for lunch. We want to talk to you some more. So we went to this restaurant, ate stuff I don't want to talk about, and then we sat there. <laughs> We began to talk, and uh, here I was, you know, in this room with all these multi-millionaires and a few billionaires, and I'm the only black colored guy in the room, man, it was feeling so good. I felt like raisin in a bowl of cornflakes, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> and they were picking my brain, man. They wanted, they were taking notes, asking me questions, keep writing stuff, writing stuff, and, and all of a sudden it hit me, you know, wait a minute. All these guys are millionaires, man. I ain't got no million dollars yet. I got it now, but I ain't got no million dollars yet. <laughs> and I'm sitting there thinking, wow, man, every Chinaman I know owns a business. And here I am in the heart of Asia, where they come from. And I said, sir, pardon me, I have a question that I need you to answer. And they looked at me. I said, tell me, how come everywhere you all go, no matter where it is, you go to the lowest ghetto in the heart of the township and you end up owning a business? Can you tell me what is your secret? And they looked at each other and they laughed. And then they spoke in a language they didn't understand. Every time you all speak English. <laughs> you all don't talk like that in front around me. I want to hear what you're saying. And they laughed. And then the president said to me, he said, well, you know, we've been noticing that ourselves, that everywhere we meet you all, and he meant people like me, he says, you are always seeming to be at the bottom of the ladder. He said, and we couldn't figure it out for a long time. I said, but please tell me, what did you find out? Because I want to know, because I ain't staying at the bottom of no ladder. And they laughed. He said, well, we have concluded based on our assessment that whenever you go into a community, the first thing you look for is a job. He says, when we come into any community, the first thing we look for is a business. He said, it's attitude. 
They don't even look for a job. <laughs> Any Chinese working for you? Come on, clap. Learn the lesson right now. Everybody say attitude. Attitude. They, they, they don't even think about employment. They think deployment. As a man thinketh, so he becomes. So here we were in Bainge Town, in the ghetto of the island. And on Augusta Street, a street right across where we live, was this Chinaman in the heart of the poorest part of the island. And we buy in from him. And I'm like, what are you doing here? Mentality. Tell your neighbor, deploy yourself. Let me say this to you. So I said to the guy, I said, excuse me. Uh, uh, so when you go into a, a, a town or any, any country, so what do you do until you get a business? He says, any employment we have is always temporary. We only want enough money to start a business, that's all. Mentality. Number six, true leadership is self-manifestation. You become a leader when you discover who you are and decide to become it. And that's how it works. True leadership is self-manifestation. Your leadership is not ahead of you. It's trapped within you. You are so great, it's amazing. But the environment won't allow you to become it. You know, one of the smartest men I know in my life is this man right here, Dr. Jerry Hanna. Smart, intelligent, have so many wonderful gifts. And I made a commitment to him last year. I said, you know, the next few years, we're gonna work together. I'm gonna get stuff out of you. I'm gonna get books out of you. I gotta get some stuff out of you. Because you, you have so much to give to the world. Sometimes our past can hold us back. Mentality, just don't allow you to to step out and take a risk. What you're doing now, it's not what you could do. Whatever you're impressed with, God's disappointed in. <laughs> this conference began, every conference we begin by faith. No money, just some good plans and a lot of good announcements. And that's what the way life is. Stop waiting for everything to show up before you start. Every leader, I tell you the truth, every leader ain't know what they're doing. <laughs> Me included. We don't know what we're doing. We just say, I got this idea, I'm going to go for it. And for heaven's sake, believe me, we ain't got no money. What I mean is for our projects. Because you are not a leader unless you're doing something you cannot pay for. Let me try it again. You missed that, Gandhi. I say, you, you're not a leader unless you are doing something you cannot pay for. Leadership demands that you got to take risks. After all, you're out front. Number seven, leadership is self-exposure. When you expose your true self, get ready. People won't understand you, but go for it. Let us meet you before you die. I was in London one time, went up north to visit an old church that a guy told me about. I walked in this old church. The church was 200 years old, old, old church, wooden, I mean, a stone church. And I went in the, in the cemetery around the church and I saw these graves. And the graves were all broken down and everything. And I saw these graves there. And they had like 16, 18, you know, uh, 15, 42, these old dates and stuff. I'm like, wow. And I'm standing there by myself 
in this graveyard, hundreds of years old, I'm looking at this thing, and I heard a voice. And the voice said, do you see those graves? Most of those people never lived on earth. I thought, what is that? I don't understand the statement. And the voice came back again. It says, most of the people you see here, they never showed up on earth. I went back to my hotel room in London. That night I was disturbed by that statement all night. I couldn't figure out what, what, what does that mean until the light came on. Oh, that means who they really were never showed up. Can I suggest, let us meet you before you die, please. Not the one the culture made. Not the one society produced. The one that's on the inside that we have yet to meet. The true self. This is why I keep telling people, you got to die empty. The keys to leadership are built on some confusion. I want to give you these, what I call the five questions of life that you have to answer to become a leader. Number one, who am I? Number two, where am I from? Number three, why am I here? Number four, what can I do? And number five, where am I going? These are the most important questions in life, and until you answer them, you will always be a follower. Who am I has to do with identity. You got to discover who you are, apart from 6.7 billion people. Number two, where am I from has to do with your heritage. And I'm not talking about your ethnicity, because your ethnic heritage is so confusing, don't try to find yourself by going back in your ethnicity. You'll never find out where you're from. Why am I here is a question of purpose. You got to discover why you were sent to the planet. Where am I going is a, is a question of destiny. And what can I do is a question of potential. And therefore, when you discover these answers, you've discovered your leadership. I know who I am. I didn't always, but I found out who I was. And secondly, I know where I came from. And I didn't come from the Bahamas. I didn't come from Africa. Because both of them are limiting. All cultures limit you. I had to come from something greater. I remember uh, an intriguing thing I found in the Bible that impressed me. Uh, uh, my greatest mentor in history in my life is Jesus Christ. And one time they asked him, where are you from? You know what his answer was? He didn't say I came from Bethlehem, grew up in Nazareth, and had friends in Capernaum. <laughs> Matter of fact, he never said he was a Jew. He never said he was a Jew. His answer was, I came down from heaven. <laughs> they, say, they said, no, 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 we know your mother, she's Mary, and your daddy, Joe. He says, no, I came down from heaven. He refused to have his heritage limited to earth. And so am I. Because you can only be where you came from. You can only do where you came from. So you got to find another heritage. I came down from my father. The word father means source. I came through Mary. I didn't come from Mary. I came through Bethlehem. I didn't come from Bethlehem. I came through Nazareth. I didn't come from Nazareth. Me, I came through Bain Town. I didn't come from Bain Town. I came through the Bahamas. I didn't come from the Bahamas. Wherever you came from can limit you or give you unlimited thinking. I was telling some friends the other day when I was uh, in, in, in Africa again, uh, in Bromfontein, I said, look, I talked to some leaders in a small room. I said, let me tell you something. I said, the reason why they call Africa Mother Africa is because you never get your heritage from your mother. Let me say it again, because some of you all missed that. That's why you carry your father's name. The seed of your identity comes from your father. So Africa is not my home. It's too small. It was a mother. I came down from my father through the mother.
That makes me limitless. I'm just like my daddy. All things are possible with my father. Tell your neighbor, act like your daddy, not your mother. <laughs> Clap your hand if you understand what I just said. You got to get that right, eh? <laughs> All right. Uh, let me... Let me wrap this up with some thoughts here. True leadership is not a method nor a technique. True leadership is an attitude. And your attitude comes from, comes alive when you become aware of, again, that has to do with your source again, where you came from. When I discovered that I came out of God, not out of the Bahamas, suddenly the Bahamas became too small for me. So today, we have effects in 90 countries right from this island because the mentality that was developed here goes beyond this entire region. Don't let where you came from physically trap you. Don't let your ethnic heritage become your graveyard. Stop being black and white and, and yellow and stuff. Forget that stuff. That's too, that's too limiting. Become like your father. Be a man. It's a spirit being. There's no limit. Beliefs and convictions of a leader can regulate the nature of their leadership, and therefore the source of beliefs is the perception of your truth. What is truth to you determines what you do with your life. Whatever you think is truth, that's how you're going to live. That's why it's important to keep getting information. Coming to meetings like this and seminars and, and all kinds of great opportunities. You know, tonight going to be a session that's going to be awesome. Matter of fact, the teacher is one of the guys whose tapes I listen to, you know. Because his thinking stretches mine. I keep coming to people who make me think. Because my belief system should always be open-ended. Everything you know is not all there is to know. That's why I'm afraid of titles. Because titles can stop you from learning. <laughs> Even promotion can stop you from learning. The minute you give somebody a title like manager, they stop reading. You call them supervisor, that's it. No more schooling. They, I've arrived, see? Titles are dangerous. <laughs> let, me, let me just take a little liberty before I get in trouble. Throw your rocks later. You know, this is especially a problem in religious people. They love titles, man. You call a guy a reverend, all of a sudden, man, he's holy. He's, if you know, forget studies. I know God now. And for heaven's sake, don't ever give him the word bishop. That's it. That's it. It's over now. My God, you know, no more study, no nothing. <laughs> Listen to me. This is just Miles Monroe's suggestion. Take it or leave it. The greater you become, write this down, the less titles you need. I repeat, the greater you become, the less titles you need. In other words, when you are not effective, you need a lot of titles to cover up for it. <laughs> Let me give you an example of great people. The goal in life, write this down, is to only be reduced to your first name. I'm going to say it again. Your goal in life should be to be reduced to your first name. In other words, you keep losing titles. Case in point. You open the Bible, and the first guy you meet, Moses, the guy... What's his last name? Don't know. Don't care. How about this one? Joshua. Hey. 
How about this one? Samuel. I mean, the guy's a big prophet. Just Samuel. <laughs> How about David? Man, he's the king. No, just David. <laughs> and you want 10 titles and ain't done nothing yet. How about this one? Obadiah. Just Jonah. How about Micah? Micah. Nam. Habakkuk. Zephaniah. Not Reverend Zephaniah, just Zephaniah. <laughs> Hegiah. Not Bishop Hegiah, just Hegiah. Zachariah. Not Saint Zachariah, just Zaki. How about Malachi? How about this one? Jesus. Oh my God. Now we get in trouble now. You call a guy by his first name. That's disrespect. That's all the devil needs to hear. <laughs> you know, even the devil knows famous people who are effective. Like Paul I know and Peter I know, but you got too many titles, he says. <laughs> Come on.